Welcome everyone. Again, my name is Mark Orlando and today we're going to be talking about building your SOC A team. The reason that I wanted to take some time to talk about this subject today is the foundation of any good security team is people. Good ones are really hard to find, they're hard to train, they're hard to retain. And so we're gonna spend some time today talking about ways that I've found um, that I've been successful doing that in the past. Before we get into that, just a few notes about me. I have about 19 years of experience in security operations. I started out as a security analyst myself and worked my way up to team lead, manager, executive. I've built and run and assessed security operations teams in both the public and private sectors. I'm also, as Carol mentioned, a SANS instructor. I currently teach SANS SEC 450, which is Blue Team Fundamentals and Security Operations. I am also an 80s kid, as you may have guessed from our theme today with the A-Team. Now, if you haven't seen the 80s show, the A-Team, it's okay, you'll still get everything that we're talking about today. Just know that I feel sad for you and I hope that you rectify that at some point. But the reason that I selected that as our theme is this show was all about a very small band of heroes on the run uh, that survived and ultimately were successful uh, by way of sheer ingenuity, working together as a team, relying on their individual strengths uh, and coming together, bringing those strengths together uh, in order to win the day. And I thought that there were a lot of parallels there between uh, that plot line, that theme and working in a sock. So, that said, let's get started. Again, foundation of a good security team is, is people. Um, again, really hard to find, really hard to retain. And there are a lot of reasons for this, some of which we'll get into, into this in this talk, but the bottom line is if we want to have high performing teams, we have to think about the traditional SOC model. How have we done this in the past? Where have we maybe gone wrong? And how do we hack that model to make it work for us? So let's start with the problem. Why is it challenging to put together a SOC A team? The traditional model is more of a reactive one. And in my view, it's largely born out of the military concept of standing a watch. The prevailing thinking being that we have to collect as much data as we possibly can, dump it into a bucket, push it to defenders so that they can wade through and pick out events of interest. Now, Again, in my experience, this model rarely changes based on the business or even the industry. Manufacturing company, great, monitor events. Forward-leaning tech company, monitor events. Financial services firm, do something different. No, just kidding, monitor events. Right? Of course, I'm generalizing. There are lots of forward-leaning organizations out there who have moved beyond being reactive, but a lot of them haven't, and there's a tremendous lack of business alignment there. There's also this concept of sustainment. And by the way, if you don't have a professional nemesis, then you really need to get one. And this one is mine, this concept of ongoing operations where once we get all of our tools and data in one place and working reasonably well, it's time to just sit back and watch and wait until we find something. And that has to change. Now, first off, we're talking about staffing and cybersecurity, so we have to mention the talent shortage, right? I think there are two camps on this issue. One is that there just aren't enough people to fill all of the open positions that are out there. The other is that there are plenty of people, it's just that our recruiting and management processes aren't mature enough to take advantage of the wide variety of talent that's out there. Now, I'm more in this latter camp. We need to stop thinking about security as an isolated discipline that requires this very narrow skill set and start thinking about it as a cross-cutting horizontal that requires lots of different backgrounds, various skills, various abilities. The challenge, I think, is figuring out how to harness and manage that talent to drive towards a common goal. So how do we do that? Let's start with some guiding questions first off. Number one, how are we as a security team creating value in our organization? Number two, what is our shared purpose and direction? How are we promoting teamwork to help us get there together? Number three, do we have the right coaching and guidance to be empowered 
and creative while accomplishing the various SOC tasks that we're doing on any given day? And finally, is our team motivated and willing to prove itself? Do we have that learning mindset? Are we hungry? Are we constantly pushing ourselves to add new capabilities to do better than we did the day before? Now, if you're part of a security operations team today, try asking yourself these questions. Or if you're about to build a team, keep these in mind at all stages. For the purposes of this discussion, let's assume that we're going to build our A-team and we have our answers in mind. So now it's time to plan. In the planning stages, uh, I'm generalizing here, and obviously there's a lot more that goes into building out an entire security operations team. But today we're talking about building the team itself, the staff, the people. So I've boiled those planning steps down to these four things. First off, we have to understand what we're defending and not just in an abstract sense. Do we have a SOC charter, a written formal document that talks about the services that we're gonna offer, what exactly we're protecting, what we're bringing to the organization, ways of working? If not, draft one. Do we have a steering committee, right? That's a group that cuts across functions in the business that informs what we're doing. They're our public face to the business. They represent our constituents, our users, other stakeholders. If not, go adopt one, string one together. You'll need these things, both the charter and a support system to level set expectations within the organization and set common goals for the team. And that's a theme that I'm gonna revisit throughout the talk today, setting goals for the team. Second, Okay, we've got our investment. Now let's run out and hire a 24 by seven SOC team with tier one, two, and three, or we're gonna hire a bunch of rock stars and we'll get a managed security service provider to do all the boring tier one stuff, right? Not so fast. Technical maturity will help us in the near term. We'll talk about that more in a minute, but social maturity is what's gonna set us up for long-term success. And that is the ability of our team to communicate effectively and work together. Given that, what's the right balance in terms of team size and structure? What's that right combination of skills and experience and new blood that we wanna bring in and train up? Internal versus external, what's the right staffing model to get us there? And it's gonna be different depending on what it is you're trying to do, what your charter looks like, what your mission looks like. Maybe you don't need 24 by seven coverage. Maybe you aren't ready for that external partner yet. So important questions to ask yourself. Number three, how are we gonna measure our team? Now in security, we all hate bolt-ons, right? Metrics are no different. They can't be bolted on after our team is up and running. So what are the me measures that you want to focus on and what levers will you have to impact those measures over time? We'll also talk more about metrics in a few minutes. And finally, our A-team probably won't operate in a vacuum. We'll be part of a multi-team structure with interdependencies on infrastructure, application development, legal, comms, what will you need from these groups? And what are you prepared to offer them in return? What soft skills will your people need in order to do that? What are our expectations? Right, let's talk more about people for a minute. In my experience, there are generally two approaches to building a new team. There's a talent-centric model and a mission-centric model. These two aren't mutually exclusive. Obviously, you need talent and you need to be focused on the mission. But I break it down this way because I find that organizations often invest too much in one at the expense of the other. Let's take a look in more detail. I want you all to think about whether or not you may be too far into one of these two camps. First, a talent-centric approach is basically finding very smart, very capable people, usually a smaller group, putting them in a room and letting them go to work. Minimal structure, minimal operational planning. I've got rock stars, they're gonna produce no matter what, magic's gonna happen. Now this will usually get you more capability faster, but your capability will be limited to what those people can reasonably do in a given day. And your success is tied to those people. When they walk out the door, a lot of your capability goes with them. Then on the mission-centric model side, which is what you often find in government contracts, very large enterprises, you see a lot of this kind of approach, there may be lots of structure and the leadership may even dictate how they want you to work, how you're gonna do analysis, how you're gonna use the tools, 
what exactly you're going to produce, what your deliverables are. And this will get you more control and transparency, but oftentimes it will also result in less flexibility and you risk missing the forest for the trees. So the team might do exactly what you're asking them to do. I want you to work these alerts, work these events, open these tickets, but no more than that. Not a lot of innovation in these kinds of environments. Again, we wanna be somewhere in the middle. We need some structure and oversight to establish common goals, but plenty of room to empower people and let them be creative, do what humans do best, right? So we have our goals and structure. We have some sense of the compromises we wanna make in terms of oversight and mission focus versus talent and creativity. So let's talk about getting out there and recruiting our magical unicorns. When recruiting, we wanna look for a few specific things. We need to look for aptitude, attitude, desire, and diversity. Diversity of thought, diversity of background, skill set, experience. And while we may need some experience in, say, specific tools, a specific network security monitoring platform, a specific SIM, and so forth, we don't wanna to rely too much on that narrow set of skills we also don't want to over rely on things like credentials, certifications, specific experience, like have you ever done this specific technical task in this tool set? And I'm going to kind of sidestep the certification, certification minefield. I think certifications are very useful to have, right? But what we don't want to do is use any one data point here to right out of the gate eliminate potentially promising candidates. We also want to avoid things that can be toxic in a team environment, like overinflated egos, possibly misrepresenting skills or experience or abilities. I know no one in this webcast is like that, but those people are out there. Uh, we need to look for those red flags. Now, let's dig into this a bit more from the perspective of the interviewing process. First off, we want to avoid binary right wrong questions when we're interviewing candidates they're often really subjective they can result in elimination of otherwise very qualified people some people just don't answer questionnaires or take tests or do those kinds of binary evaluations well but they can still make great analysts great team members so instead we want to focus on core skills like problem sensitivity critical thinking ordering information focus on situational experience over specific technical experience where possible. Now, I'm gonna pause for a minute and say that when it comes to technical evaluations, I am a huge fan of giving out technical evaluations as an initial screening step. So something that I've done in the past is say, take a set of PCAPs or a technical problem and give those out in advance of a later interview to let a candidate kind of show off their technical skills or maybe at least show off their ability to do a little bit of research and try to work their way through a problem, you know, write something up. At the very least, you can maybe get a window into where they are so you know how to better evaluate them. But again, I don't see those things as a pass fail kind of gate. It's just another useful data point as a part of the process. So here on this slide are is an example, excuse me, of some questions that we can ask to evaluate a candidate's critical thinking skills, for example. And this is from a paper that I'll reference again here in a bit that was done um, by the Department of Homeland Security. And I thought this encapsulated the kinds of situational questions that I really like to ask. So again, example, question on critical thinking, describe a process, whether that's an analytic process, your incident response process, you know, describe a process that you did in a past role and look for strong responses. And strong responses are gonna be characterized by being very specific. The candidate should explain the steps and the order that they were designed to be carried out. They should also demonstrate an understanding of the rationale behind the process. Why did we do it this way? What were we trying to achieve? You should also look for signs that they actually followed the process or else had a very compelling rationale for why they deviated. I never did this particular step because I found it was really ineffective, created a lot of false positives. But then as part of that, they should also have improvements, unexpected results, and things that contributed to that. So I found a lot of false positives in this step uh, or in this source of data. So I took some steps to refine our analytic, 
or tune the tools or change the process, right? Those are the kinds of things we want to look for. Red flags we want to avoid in this kind of question. Overly broad answers, vague, disconnected explanation of the process. Well, we uh, we looked at these events and then maybe we would check like one or two tools and I'm not really sure. Uh, uncertainty about the answers. Unable to articulate the rationale behind the process. Well, this is just how we did it. This is the playbook, so I just kind of followed it every time. Um, that's what I was told, that's what I did. Not really sure why. Indicators that they didn't follow the process or were inconsistent about doing that, or maybe pointing out weaknesses without any improvements or contributing factors. Well, this thing never worked when we did it. I don't know why, so I just never did it. it just It just was broken, uh, didn't work, right? Those are the kinds of things we wanna look out for. Another thing we wanna look for when we're bringing the team together, avoid collaboration chillers. And here are some examples of that. So we have our mission, we've got our team structure, we've got some great new hires. So when we bring them all together, we wanna to avoid these things. Now, collaboration chillers you know, isn't the new Mountain Dew flavor. These are things that can kill even the most creative and skilled teams. Do we notice a theme here? Sharing information collaboration, communication, listening, right? Interpersonal communications, right? The theme here is the team collaborating, communicating with each other, working well together. We wanna to avoid things that are gonna negatively impact that. We also need to think about something I see as an issue in almost every SOC team that I encounter, but we rarely call it out and we rarely focus on it. And that's something called shared knowledge of unique expertise or SKU. Improving SKU fosters better collaboration, faster analysis, and instant response. We can do that by using things like knowledge tools, making sure we have a good usable knowledge base that is constantly being updated and growing, being utilized by the team. We can improve this by training people outside of their specialties, task shifting, rotating roles, and we can also improve this by doing structured reviews, things like after action reviews, structured discussions before and during an instant response process or an investigation. We'll talk more about those in just a, a few moments. Uh, this is a really interesting concept. I think it encapsulates one of the biggest challenges that I see and it's described in detail uh, in the paper that I linked on the previous slide in which I'll reference again in a few minutes, uh, the one done by DHS. Trust is also critical. Clear goals, roles, and standards will help each team member understand not only what's expected of them, but also what they should expect from their teammates. Communication norms are also important. These are the things that management or team leadership within the SOC sets by example. I mentioned structured reviews on the last slide, and we'll talk about it more in a few minutes when we get to training, but by leading some of these structured discussions, by providing direct feedback, uh, not only when things are going well, but when things are not going well and they need to be improved, right? Making failure a learning process, something to be discussed and, anal discussed and analyzed. Uh, those are how we create a safe space for open communications, establish those communication norms within the team, uh, and help people understand that even when things aren't going well, even when inevitable failures happen, that's okay, we're gonna learn from that, and we can discuss it. That's very important, key part of building that trust. When it comes to training, classroom style instruction is important, and sometimes that is the best medium to get your team the skills and the expertise that they need. It's great for things like procedures or specific tools, what to document, how to document it, but training is so much more than that. We need to invest in training for things like analytic mindset or investigative mindset, verbal and written communications, right? the business context for what the SOC is doing. Remember, we talked about SOC charter at the top of the presentation. If you have that, that's gonna give you really great business context for what it is you're doing. And every SOC analyst, everyone on the team should be able to talk about what it is you're protecting. How does your work on a daily basis impact the business? How does it play into the value that the business is producing? Also, and this one is very important, train your own people wherever possible. 
We just talked about trust and communications. Training is a great opportunity to build that trust within the team. So this is something that I learned uh, back in a previous life as a non-commissioned officer in the military. Uh, you have to get in there with your people. You may not always have the skills that you need to train someone, let's say in a specific tool uh, or a specific task, but whenever you can, get in there, work with them, do the training yourself, right? Not only will that create that trust between you and your team, but it'll set those communication norms, you know, keep those communication channels open, um, you know, as you work to build that trust and, and make your team better. Ultimately, we're all collaborative problem solvers in the SOC, and no training discussion would be complete without talking about ways that we can improve that. Here are some things that I personally have found to be immensely useful when doing a hunt or responding to an incident. Conduct a pre-briefing to set goals and priorities and talk about, for example, things that could go wrong. That's called a pre-mortem, excuse me, pre-mortem in some scenarios. Right? Do something similar after the fact, post-mortem to review lessons learned. Conduct simulations. Right? Have your red team engage with your SOC team run through some exercises, test your detections, test your processes, you know, purple team stuff. Make sure individuals are getting focused feedback, not just at review time or periodically or when something goes wrong or is missed, but continuously. I'm gonna pause there and just ask all of the attendees a rhetorical question, when is the last time you got focused constructive feedback? If it's been a while, go ask for it. If you're a team lead or a manager, try giving some out today. Also, seriously, train your own people. So we've set up our team for success, but how do we keep them successful and engaged? This is a big one. A lot of teams stand up successfully, they're off and running, they get some initial wins because we're fielding all these new capabilities, new controls, okay? It's not difficult to get some early wins and some early successes in a team. But keeping the team successful, keeping them engaged, that is a far bigger challenge. And there are lots of ways that we can do that. First off, there's a fine line between gamification, which I love, and competition. A little healthy competition is not a bad thing. But ultimately, we want a competition-free zone in terms of how the analysts are interacting with each other, right? We're all on the same team. So look for ways that you can challenge the team without pitting them against each other. We also want to avoid what I call the superhero problem, where we're relying far too heavily on a few key people for most of our capability. So again, we can rotate roles, task shift, cross train. I started a, a discussion or a brief thread on Twitter a few weeks ago around gamification in the SOC, and I had a lot of really good responses, uh, one of which was, uh, the cyber cupcake, which I really liked, someone uh, sending, you know, essentially a virtual cupcake to somebody else saying, hey, this is your cyber cupcake, you did a great job, uh, and uh, I really like that idea. Um, anything that, you know, may not have monetary value, but is awarded, you know, by vote or by the team, you know, anyone can give someone else kudos, I find that those are really good motivators. Uh, I've used virtual badge systems in the past that are maybe built into a case management system to say, okay, you got the responding to an incident in the middle of the night on a weekend badge, or you did a firewall upgrade, uh, you get the firewall upgrade badge, uh, those can be pretty fun. Uh, I also heard someone say point system with prizes that you can redeem your points, uh, like a gift card or something after a while. All those things are great, good ways to keep people engaged without, again, kind of pitting them against each other. So think for a minute about incentives. Are your metrics incentivizing the right behaviors? Are you incentivizing collaboration? Uh, and then finally, and this is something that we talk a lot about in SEC 450, uh, which I really like uh, when we talk about keeping things fun and engaging and exciting in the SOC. And that's the Eisenhower principle. Um, this is where tasks can be urgent or not urgent, important or not important, and the, the main idea here is we wanna focus on the things that are important, make time for things that aren't urgent, but may still be important. Um, and in the next slide, I'll show you, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, 
visualized as a matrix here where the upper left quadrant are things that are both important and urgent. Uh, these examples aren't necessarily specific to security operations, but things like high confidence critical events or indicator and warning data that fires off, right? You know it's good, you know there's an issue, an attacker is moving laterally through the environment, they're exfilling data, and these are urgent things that are coming up that you can't, um, that can't wait, you can't deprioritize them. There are also things that might be urgent but not particularly important. You have a false positive alert that's firing off and it's critical and it's filling up your screen. That is, that is urgent but may not be quite as important as other um, more critical things that you need to work on. So um, that upper right quadrant, things that may not be emergencies, may not be urgent, nothing's on fire, but is still very important. Those are the things we wanna make time for. And here uh, we've called out things like, you know, personal health, exercising, spending time with family and friends. In a SOC context, I would say those are things like building your skills, right? Providing feedback to each other, doing training, uh, taking a look at our infrastructure, making improvements, uh, designing and implementing automations, all those things may not be urgent, but they're still critical to long-term success. We need to make time for those things. Now, one of my favorite topics in security operations, metrics, and I'm sure you're all excited about this as well. Ideally, we've got two types of metrics, one set, that is internal to the team and measures a lot of the things that I've been talking about today, communication, collaboration, performance of your technology, individual performance of your analysts, and then one set of metrics that's external to the team. Things like time to detection, time to response, you know, this is the, the value that you're bringing to the business. Now we've got, within those two groups, different types of measures. There are key performance indicators, which, instrument our operation, things like coverage or uh, threat visibility, control we have over our assets, uh, numbers of things that we're responding to, how we're spending our time, those are all KPIs. I really like OKRs, um, which are objectives and key results. Uh, this is a concept that uh, essentially describes kind of meta metrics, which tie your operations to strategy. So how it works is, is this. You pick out a organizational goal, or in our case, a goal for the SOC at large. I want to reduce successful social engineering attacks. I'm getting lit up, I'm constantly responding to these, I wanna reduce successful attacks. Or I want to reduce identification and response time. Uh, that's gonna be an objective that has a finite end date. I want to improve by this much, by this time. Maybe it's monthly, maybe it's quarterly, um, but it's time boxed. And then I want to identify key results that will help me meet that objective and then monitor, measure those results to make sure that I hit it. Uh, so that's a good way to get out of that kind of day-to-day -day sustainment mindset and say, here are specific measurable gains or improvements that I wanna make that are tied to higher level strategic objectives and I'm gonna measure my progress towards those. So I'm a big fan of using both KPIs and OKRs, KPIs would be more ongoing uh, operations uh, management and monitoring. OKRs, again, more finite. Uh, think of them like sprints. Um, you know, these are things that we want to accomplish in a specific time frame. Watch out for bad metrics. Bad metrics are things like color-based metrics. We are red on this without any quantitative data to back that up or qualitative data to back that up, right? What does red mean exactly? Red, yellow, green, uh, those are fine for visualizing data, but if we have metrics that are straight up colors without data behind them, uh, those are not the best metrics. They're not very measurable. Uh, they're very subjective. Things like volume. We generated a million alerts yesterday and we generated uh, nine million alerts today. Right? What are those things tell you? They don't really tell a story. Uh, it presupposes that all that is good data, that those are good alerts, and we have no way of knowing that. So again, things that are subjective don't really tell a story. We wanna stay away from those. Measuring people. Evaluating people can be a sticky topic. The goal is to inform, 
to foster learning, help our team mature, not to penalize. We wanna avoid quantitative measures. You analyst only worked three cases last week, or you only looked at 80 alerts yesterday. Uh, again, that doesn't really tell a story. It doesn't help us identify where people can improve or where they need to maybe train or areas they need to focus on. Again, key to all of this, direct and continuous feedback. You need to have set up that safe space for communications. So in order for people to be comfortable accepting constructive feedback or even uh, you know positive feedback, that trust needs to be there. They need to understand that you have their best interests and the team best the team's best interests in mind before you give them that direct and continuous feedback. So it's important to establish that trust right out of the gate. Here are some really great resources. We could do an entire presentation talking about this sort of thing and some incredibly smart people already have. So I've taken some of those resources, I've put them here. By no means uh, is this exhaustive, but um, check out, first of all, this presentation by my fellow SANS instructor, Chris Crowley, SOC expert. He has this concept of analyst baseball cards, and I'll throw up his example of one of those in a moment. I'm also a huge fan of Chris Sanders writing um, really about all topics, but he's done a blog post here about working in a SOC, um, you know, tours of duty, InfoSec careers, really, really good stuff. I highly recommend you check that out. But here's an example of Chris Crowley's analyst baseball card. I think this speaks to our SKU, shared knowledge of unique expertise. Uh, talks about not only kind of some of the stats here, you know, in this case, what's uh, Chris Crowley's kind of record in terms of true positives, <clears throat> excuse me, how many cases he's escalated, but we've got some fun stuff in here. There's a call sign, uh, how long he's been around. So if you have new analysts coming in uh, and they're filling this out, and then as a manager, you're kind of maintaining this, not only does this help the team understand where its collective strengths and weaknesses are and kind of uh, maybe foster some of that um, healthy competition, but it also helps new team members, new analysts get up to speed very quickly on kind of who knows what, uh, where the different areas of focus are, and uh, you know, again, builds that shared knowledge uh, very quickly in kind of a fun way, I think. So now we have our A team, right? We're ready to go out, do all the things, but there are a few challenges that we need to be aware of when operating at this new high rockstar level. One, when analysts believe they're part of strong teams, I know this is going to shock everyone, they can be more hesitant to trust and collaborate with people outside of those teams. We can adopt kind of an inward focus. Okay, I've seen this both within SOX where you have specific kind of focused cells that are doing maybe uh, Intel or malware analysis or forensics, right? We, we adopt kind of this view that um, our perspective is the only lens through which we're going to see problems, okay? We, we start to take on that role-oriented bias and we need to try to avoid that. Another challenge is that if we've built up our team to be very high performing, very strong kind of multi-team structure or a very cohesive single team, that can obscure the weaknesses of individual groups or individual contributors. So I'm sure we've all seen this at some point. Maybe there's an individual contributor, an analyst who has things that they need to improve, okay? But if we don't have that open communication channel, if we don't understand where those strengths and weaknesses are, if the overall team is performing really well, it can obscure some of those improvements that we need to make. So we need to watch out for that. And then I also threw up, again, my nemesis, sustainment mode. We need to watch out for that mindset where we just kind of get into day-to-day -day operations. It's really more about just keeping things going. We're not pushing, we're not trying to improve. We need to watch out for that. Here are some of the things that you can do to avoid these issues or to address them when you identify them. I think the biggest one is that people work best when they are pushed to the edge of their knowledge and abilities. Now, that's not a place that you can live all the time, but it's really important for you to challenge your team. We've talked about some ways to do that. We talked about task shifting. We talked about doing structured walkthroughs. Okay, give the team problems to solve, <coughs> excuse me, challenges that they need to address. Special projects are also really great for this. But if you're not pushing the team to the edge, if they're not adopting that learning mindset, 
and you're not reinforcing that on an ongoing basis, that sustainment mentality kind of sets in and it can be more about just kind of keeping the lights on. And of course, we want to avoid that. Now, as we approach the end of our presentation, I wanted to share some case studies. These are scenarios that I've been a part of in the past, uh, again, building out different teams or different capabilities and how some of the things that I've talked about today kind of played into that. So I wanted to share just a couple of those scenarios with you. First up was a new SOC that I built for a certain executive branch agency. Hopefully I'm not giving anything away by the clip art in the picture, but this was back in 2008 timeframe. It was a small but very, very high profile agency with a very technical customer. Lots of brand new technology that in fact, the customer had deployed a lot of it, a brand new team brought in to staff a 24 by seven security operations center. Now, right out of the gate, we had some big challenges. The customer wanted a talent oriented team. They wanted rock stars in there. Remember, very technical customer, but the team had been staffed, I should add prior to my arrival, in more of a mission centric model. So if anyone on the call has worked in the federal sector and done security operations there, you know that they place an emphasis in many cases on prior experience in Fed, things like security clearances, other hoops that are not necessarily technical focused that you had to have been through in order to be qualified to join the team. So we definitely had a customer and an environment that required that talent centric model, but we staffed according to more of a mission centric model. It was more about experience in the specific industry, in the specific kind of environment. We also had a very limited budget in terms of tools and other things, so there wasn't a lot left for things like formal training and, and other expenses. So, a bit of a challenge there. So, with everything we've talked about today in mind, here was my approach. Given that it was a brand new team, the first thing I had to do was set some specific goals and objectives for that team. And quite honestly, I had to be prepared for turnover because again, if you're too far in the mission oriented camp where it's more about just being able to walk through the process as dictated by the contract or the customer, but they are expecting a very talented team, you've got a gap that you've got to navigate. So setting those individual goals and objectives was part of closing that gap for me. We also did a lot of desk side training, a lot of cross training, to build team cohesion, which you really need to do with any new group. And we included the customer in those activities. This included some of the structured walkthroughs that we've already talked about, taking incidents, making sure we set aside time to talk about those, talk about how our new processes held up in those situations, areas that we needed to improve, communications that we needed to improve. We also emphasized quick wins. Okay. Again, really important with any new capability. We expanded our visibility this day. We deployed this new tool. We set up this new process and now we're able to achieve things that we weren't before. So, so important to highlight those things. And then finally, I came up with detailed metrics for the build out and the activation process, that initial operational capability or IOC, and a separate set for fully operational capability. This was after the build out phase was finished and we were into ongoing operations. This is really important when you're building out, you don't necessarily, if you can avoid it, want to start measuring your final output when you're still in the phase of kind of building out and adding and refining uh, to your capability set. So having those two sets of measures, for example, you know, how are we establishing communications with other groups and other teams in the enterprise, right? How are we deploying more technology to get the visibility that we ultimately will need? You know, those are great kind of initial build out type metrics. And then once we reached that fully operational capability, kind of shifted gears and we started measuring things like, okay, now we can be held to a higher standard. You know, what's the time that we're taking to identify and respond to intrusions and things like that. So being able to have those two sets of metrics was really, really helpful uh, in providing transparency to the customer and also kind of measuring ourselves on the right things. Second case study, fast forward a few years. Uh, in 2013, I built um, a managed detection and response service, an MDR. Now, this was at a pretty small security services company. It was, in fact, before MDR was even a term that was used, of course, you had 
MSSPs, but people weren't really doing a lot of this kind of threat hunting and its response as a service. So we were setting this up, lots of challenges here. We had very clear goals of where we ultimately wanted to be. No, it says few, but really no processes to speak of. We were building up from scratch. What does a service like this look like? What did we need the team to do? Not a lot of quality checks or performance standards or team structure. And ultimately with a new service like this, the customer is gonna drive your requirements. So you have where you think you're gonna go, where you think you're gonna get, but customer feedback is gonna maybe change those things, uh, give you a lot of twists and turns that you didn't really expect. So how did we build our A-team for the MDR? First off, we had to opt for a talent-centric model. So we had an idea of our mission and what we wanted to accomplish, but it was still a little bit fuzzy and we knew that customer requirements were gonna shift. We definitely knew that we needed lots of capability fast. So we focused that talent that we were able to bring in through good key performance indicators, KPIs, constant communication, constant. And we use those things and some creative incentives to create a generative environment. So again, this was kind of a startup environment, startup mentality. We needed new ideas to flow freely. We needed the analysts to wear multiple hats and be able to execute improvements on their own. And our failures, of which there were plenty, were discussed openly, addressed as a group. Um, we created social situations where the team could interact. Uh, and kind of build a, an internal culture and, and become a more cohesive group. So we ended up being being very successful. We ultimately sold that as part of an acquisition, um, but uh, it was a lot of work to get it going. And again, this is more of a small talent-centric model, and that's just where we had, had to start in that scenario. Now, takeaway, uh, hopefully that you all have here, is that talent can be found lots of different places. It's not overly important where someone has been, the specific tools or technologies they've worked in. Uh, talent is talent, and you need to know how to identify it. You need to foster it when you do identify it and retain it if you can. But ultimately, we're all about setting people up for success, whether they remain with your organization or not, right? But you gotta try to retain it in order to maintain that team cohesion for as long as you can. The difference between an A-team and everyone else is not how sharp somebody is or how elite some, somebody's skills might be. It's more about social maturity of the team. How well do they collaborate and work together? How cohesive is the group? And measurable progress. So if you can't look back on the previous month, the previous quarter, the previous year, and see how the team has improved measurably in terms of its ability to identify and respond to threats, or work more effectively together, or bring more value to your organization, then you really need to revisit that because that is a differentiator between an A-team, a really sharp, high-performing team, and everybody else. Now some homework. As everyone logs off and goes about their day, I want you all to think about some things. First off, does everyone on your team, if you work in a SOC, know the SOC charter? Even if it's not a formal written document that you have somewhere, do you know what your charter is and is it the same answer no matter who you ask? Second question, how are you removing barriers to communications and teamwork? We all have those barriers. Communications, working together, it can be a sloppy business, but how are you identifying and removing those barriers consistently? What are those communications norms that have been established in the team? And are there negative norms that have been established that you might need to revisit? Go out and conduct a pre-briefing, do a pre-mortem. Whether that's working a case, an investigation, an instant response, take a few minutes to try to set that up, bring the team together virtually or in person if you can, and conduct that pre-briefing. Here's what we're gonna do. Here are the things that we're gonna walk through. Here's what I want everyone to do, what the roles are within the team, right? Lastly, look for poor ratings, poor metrics, things that are subjective things that are not really telling a story, they're just you know numbers or colors or graphs that you throw up on a report and kick up to management just because that's what you've always done and you need to. Try to revisit that with fresh eyes and look for some of those poor subjectives, rating, ratings or metrics. Finally, I wanted to leave you all with some additional resources. 
uh, obviously this is a huge topic and something that we just aren't going to cover in totality um, in, in this format. But if you're very interested in this and you wanna learn more, of course, I have to plug SANSEC 450. I do actually think it's a fantastic course. Uh, a lot of content in, the, content in there about keeping the SOC a fun and engaging place to work. It is not and should not be a stepping stone, a holding pattern uh, on your way to a different discipline. It is its own uh, very exciting discipline. It should be that way. We talk a lot about how to keep it that way uh, in SEC 450. We also have the SANS SOC Summit Presentation Archive. There's tons of great stuff there, a lot uh, of, of good content from very smart people working the field about working in a SOC and building teams and running teams. Uh, I referenced this paper quite a bit today, Improving Social Maturity of Cybersecurity Incident Response Teams. Again, this was the paper that was commissioned by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, lots of different groups and organizations contributed, including George Mason University, uh, and several others. It's a fantastic paper um, handbook, really, on how to help teams work more effectively together, uh, specifically cybersecurity teams. And then, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention MITRE's uh, 10 Strategies of World-Class Cyber Operations Centers. Um, a few years old at this point, Carson Zimmerman's uh, paper, but uh, still, I think, has a lot of very relevant lessons and a lot of useful things uh, that we can take away in terms of building SOCs and running them effectively. So with that, I will turn it back over to Carol uh, for any questions, but if you don't have any questions today or you uh, aren't comfortable speaking up, you can always reach out to me directly at this email, mark at bionicsyber.com. Uh, I also am pretty active on Twitter, so you can find me there at Mark A. Orlando. So thank you very, very much for your time today. All right, thanks for that great presentation. We do have a few questions ready for the Q&A. However, if anyone has a question for Mark, please enter it into the questions window now. Our first one asks, uh, oh, it just scrolled out of view. Give me one moment here. What does the metric uh, QKR stand for? Or it might be OKR, it's very small. <laughs> I see, so yes, it's OKR. Those are objectives and key results. Um, I think that was pioneered by Andy Grove at Intel, if I'm not mistaken, uh, several years ago. And it's just kind of a compliment when we talk about KPIs. OKRs is um, more of a strategic kind of metric. It's a type of metric. So objectives and key results, OKR. All right, thank you. While defining SOC mission and charter, how can we differentiate between a SOC and a SecOps team? The latter brings in several tasks that are tied to system administration, upgrades, patching, et cetera. Yeah, good question. So I tend to use those terms interchangeably, SOC and SecOps. Uh, I think that they mean different things depending on the organization and depending on your mission. Um, you know, for example, in some cases, to, to your point, there might be more engineering oriented tasks or there might be more instant response oriented tasks. In some organizations, those are not part of the SOC. It's more about just monitoring, uh, investigation, escalation, things like that. So I think that's why having um, a defined set of stakeholders uh, and a set charter that says, here are all the things that the SOC does can help you define that and determine you know, what's a part of your service catalog, for example, you know, what's a part of your offering um, that you're providing to the organization It can help you kind of focus on those lanes. Um, not necessarily to say no to certain things, but to understand, okay, we do have an engineering function, uh, we are maintaining infrastructure, or we do have an instant response or forensics function, and so we need to staff for that, we need to have those skill sets. If you don't have those requirements and that charter well-defined up front, uh, it can be tough to know, you know, what should be part of the SOC and what's not. It can also be tough to know what people are expecting out of the SOC and what's not. If you have a mismatch on those things, it can end up being really bad. So uh, hopefully that answers the, the question. But having that well-defined charter, uh, making one if you don't have one today, it's pretty important. All right, thanks. Would you rather have the incident responders or monitors do the SecOps related tasks as well to build the SKU, SKU SKUE, 
or have a separate team within the SOC that is responsible for the SecOps related tasks? Right. So I think your mileage may vary here. I think certainly I advocate for task shifting where if they are separate groups, let's say you have a monitoring group and you have an instant response group and they're wholly separate, you know, different skill sets, which which I can certainly see being the case. Um, I'm a big fan of having sort of different tours of duty where uh, folks on the SOC team might spend some time on the instant response group and vice versa. Um, I think that just kind of builds awareness and understanding uh, of work outside of your world. So if I'm focused on monitoring and I'm throwing stuff over the fence to the IR team, it might help my perspective to spend some time over there and understand what they're expecting, the challenges they deal with, what it looks like when they get the things that I throw over, over the fence. Um, in another sense, I do think that having a group that is strictly focused on monitoring and escalation only, not doing any instant response tasks, uh, I tend to uh, try to avoid that. I think there's no reason that the folks that are doing that monitoring and investigation, why they can't take on some of the instant response capabilities, I just think that's more efficient. I think it's better to keep those folks engaged um, and give them more of a career path. So I'm generally not a huge fan of keeping those completely separate even though you might not have your SOC analyst doing all of the instant response. Um, I do like some cross-pollination there. Even if you're not doing that, I think task shifting and, and moving people around, even if temporarily, is a good thing. All right, thanks so much. How do you advise SOC managers to react to the lack of performance as individuals? Oh, I'm sorry lack of performance of individuals, as this can be tricky in today's job market and can differ with managers who are interested in keeping the jobs filled. Yeah, um, that's, that, that is a challenge. Um, and I think it comes down to communication, communication, communication. Um, this is why it's so important when you're hiring to set expectations, be as clear and as specific as possible. You know, here are the things that you need to be able to do. Here are the performance standards that we've set that are tied to our metrics, what the team has to accomplish, and here's how what you are expected to do is going to contribute to those things, right? So if you're not doing those things, if you're not meeting those performance standards, you know, we're gonna take a hit, um, you know, at the team level. So being very clear about that upfront um, and that's everything from here, the technical abilities that you're, you know, maybe you don't need to do today, all of them, but you need to have them, you know, by this date, this milestone, what have you. I've done that a lot with junior folks that you're bringing into the team. You know, you need to be at this level at this time as evidenced by these things that you should be able to do reliably. Um, and then ongoing communications. So a lot of times we all get busy. I'm sure we've all been in jobs where the only time we talked to our managers about performance was at our review. And you know there are a lot of surprises in there. So I'm a firm believer that when you sit down for those kinds of formal annual or um, you know twice annually reviews, nothing should be a surprise, right? You should have had discussions, anything that you need to improve, uh, areas where you're not meeting performance standards, you should be well aware of those because you should be talking to your manager, your leadership all the time about where you're at. You know, hey, we had this case, you worked it. Here's some of the things I saw in there that, you know, areas where I think you can improve and, and here's, you know, what we should do to, to get you where you need to be. So I think it just comes down to having that, that open communication, talking early and often. Um, and it's still very challenging, even if you're doing that, but I think you can avoid a lot of um, heartache and frustration if you're at the very least communicating on a regular basis. All right, thanks. Mark, how much do you think military experience either helps or hurts hiring SOC analysts? I'm a huge fan of hiring people with military backgrounds. Um, I have that myself. Um, I by no means do I think that that's um, the only relevant non-technical maybe background for folks to have, but um, you know, I, I certainly like hiring folks with that background just because there are certain baseline set of trainings that they tend to have, not always, but tend to have uh, in terms of organizational skills, time management, you know, things like that. So 
um, big fan of that as a talent pool. But you know, I also have encountered scenarios where you have to kind of break people out of of some of those mindsets. Um, for example, you know, the military kind of chain of command where uh, I'm only going to do the things that I know that I'm authorized to do. I'm not going to step outside of that lane. I'm going to ask permission for everything. You know, sometimes you got to break down some of those, uh, depending on where someone comes from specifically and, and the job they were doing. But uh, otherwise, I, I think it's a great talent pool to pull from. Even folks that have not did not do technical work uh, in the military, I've found um, I've had a lot of success there. All right, thank you. Uh, someone says, thanks for this presentation. Based on your experience, how can we handle home office and remote working within a SOC? Great question. I answer this question from my home office. Um, and when I built the MDR, uh, that was a distributed team. Um, we didn't have a SOC starting out. So uh, I think it can be done. I think in this day and age, there is no reason not to have a distributed team, uh, have people working remotely that lets you kind of get the talent where it is and not be confined to a specific geographical area. And the technology certainly supports it um, with a few caveats. I think you've got to have certain things built into the culture of your team, like daily check-ins, being on collaboration tools all the time. You know, the team has to have that kind of baked into their DNA that they're constantly collaborating and staying in touch online and are able to work virtually. Um, it can be tough saying everybody's used to working in a SOC in person, the same place. Now we're going to switch to remote. I think that can be a little tougher. But as long as you have designed your processes around being a remote distributed team, um, it can work great. Uh, I would also just add that if you do that, I found that building in budget and time to bring the team together in person to form some of those social connections uh, is really, really important as well. We did that a lot. In the MDR, we had you know annual or, or few times annually, we had events where we brought everyone together in the same place for a couple of days, um, and that helped a ton. Uh, 